So are we headed to World War III? I just want to remind you that as a historian, I can tell you that World War II didn't start out as World War II. It started out as a regional conflict. It developed into a world war because there was a combination of different regional conflicts that have combined into one single world war. So the question is, is the regional conflict right now in Israel between the Israelis and Hamas can develop and has the potential to drag more countries into it, turning it into World War III? Now, a lot of people are talking about this over social media, over X, YouTube, CNN, Fox. Now, in this video, I'm going to break it apart piece by piece. And of course, I'm going to tell you what my prediction is based on the data, analytics, and logic. But just a little caveat before we start, we are talking about the Middle East. So any logic or some sort of an analytical analysis of what can happen has to be taken with a shovel of salt because these guys are some of the craziest on the planet and a lot of unexpected things can happen overnight, making this whole analysis pretty much irrelevant. So take that into consideration. Now let's talk about how this whole thing started. As I mentioned before, we can go back 75 years, 3,000 years, but for the sake of this debate, because we're talking about result, consequence, and action, let's go back to October 7th. On October 7th, Hamas carried out a massive, horrible terrorist attack on the population of Israel. Now, that attack was much more successful in the eyes of the Hamas than they even anticipated because they've managed not to only kill 1,400 civilians, women and children and men, but also to capture about 240 hostages, which they took back into Gaza and now being used as a bargaining chip in this war. If we go back 20, 30 years ago, this sort of operation, if you say, well, Hamas is going to take over whole cities in Israel and hold them for about a few hours and they're going to take hundreds of hostages, and they're going to kill thousands of Israelis, that would have seemed impossible. So their level of success, and I use the word success operationally, obviously, here, because this was a heinous, horrific crime against humanity, but their level of executional success actually was too much. I don't think they anticipated to be that successful given the intelligence strength and the military strength on the Israeli side. So now that the Israelis have been basically caught off guard with their pants and on their ankles, and that's a fact, now what we're looking at is a massive, colossal intelligence, executional, and military failure on the Israeli side. So how do they deal with it? The only thing that Israel can do after getting embarrassed like that on October 7th is to root out Hamas. There's no other scenario here. It's a zero-sum game for the Israelis. That level of offensive, that level of casualties, hostages, taking over cities, loss of sovereignty, loss of governance, that can only be resolved with the removal of Hamas. There's not anything in between that can bring things to where they used to be. And that's why when people scream, cease fire and stop the hostilities, the Israelis are not listening because at this point, it's a zero-sum game. It's an existence. It's a a very basic need for them not to have Hamas as the neighbor, which they cannot live with. So the Israelis is in total war. But here's the interesting question. So what is this war looking like? So you have to understand that the Gaza Strip, most of you obviously have not been there, and neither did I, but I'm a student of the game and a student of history. So the Gaza Strip is about one quarter of the size of the city of London. Now, the city of London is 600 square miles, and they have about 9 million population in the city of London. The Gaza Strip is literally one quarter of that. It's about 150 square miles with 2.2 million population. So imagine one quarter of London. That's the thing we're talking about. Massive stretch of land with 2.2 hostile population that hate their guts, with tunnels, with ambushes, with side uh, IEDs, with rocket prepared grenades, with with coordinate missiles, anti-tank weaponry, snipers, drones, <laughs> and hundreds of hostages. So they're going into this mission understanding that it's going to take weeks, probably months, for them to get any sort of progress, and probably years until they clean up Gaza from Hamas entirely. This isn't going to be a two-week operation. It has to take months and years, probably as long as we've seen it happen in Ukraine. We're looking at at least 18 months of operation to clean out the Gaza Strip. So if it's going to take months or even potentially years, 
And of course, it has no good ending for anybody here. That's a whole different video, right? The Israelis, if they don't stay after they conquer Gaza and clean out Hamas, they're going to have Hamas 2.0 20 years. If they stay, they're going to be a conquering force and going to be dealing with guerrilla warfare every single day. Uh, th there's no good solutions here. But that's a whole different video. But the question is, how will the regional powers and the other interested parties in this going to react to this Israeli operation in Gaza? Now, let's start with Egypt. Egypt is the closest to Gaza. They actually share a border and a border passage with Gaza. And will the Egyptians, uh, which actually do have a significant army, get involved in this and potentially get into a conflict with Israel over what Israel is doing to the Palestinians in Gaza? No. So not at this time, at least. Uh, e Egypt, first of all, they have a peace agreement with Israel, but also you have to understand that Egypt actually has a president that's a secular, pragmatic leader who hates the guts of the Muslim Brotherhood more than anything in life, and they're the biggest threat to his rule. So the Muslim Brotherhood, which is the long-distant cousin of the Hamas, they're literally the sworn enemy of the president of Egypt. So Egypt is not getting involved in this whatsoever. Even though they can't say it out loud, Egypt would like nothing more than Israel to completely destroy Hamas. They need them to be successful, even though they can't voice that. So Israel is going to do its thing. Egypt is going to stay on the sidelines and just say all the right things in support of the Palestinians, giving them food and water and aid, but they're not going to do anything going against Israel. Same thing with Jordan. Jordan is across the border or on the other side next to West Bank. Jordan really doesn't have a military anymore. They do have a peace agreement with Israel. They do have 70% population of Palestinians, but there's no military there. There's no interest there. They have nothing in this game that they want except to say the right things, to pay the lip service in favor of the Palestinians, not to take, God forbid, any refugees and stay out of this as much as they possibly can. So the closer neighbors, which is Jordan and Egypt, are staying out of this. Now, the region also have a northern border with Lebanon. Now, Lebanon is a whole different story. There's no love lost between Lebanon and Israel, even though Lebanon is now kind of quadrupled into four different countries within one. But Lebanon in itself kind of uh, is no longer one single country with one single military that can do anything. The owners of Lebanon is a proxy organization of Iran called Hezbollah. Now, Hezbollah operate, own, and de facto is the administrator of Lebanon. And Hezbollah is a well-armed, well-equipped organization with hundreds of thousands of precision rockets, and they can make a lot of damage to Israel. But the last time they've done it, and they've actually had massive achievements against Israel on the battlefield, what Israel ended up doing is destroying uh, literally half of Beirut, which is the uh, capital city of, of Lebanon, essentially telling Hezbollah, well, if you're going to do it again, we're going to 10 times harder. So they've destroyed the uh, one quarter of, of Lebanon, uh, or Lebanon's capital, uh, uh, Beirut. It's called the Dahia quarter. And now they're telling to Hezbollah, look, if you get involved, fine, you're going to inflict a lot of damage. You're going to destroy infrastructure in Israel. You're not going to change the outcome of this war because you don't have tanks and F-15s and F-16s. You don't really have that much infantry to actually do anything, but you will cause me a lot of pain. But in return, I'm going to demolish Lebanon. And the entire existence of Hezbollah will no longer be relevant because Lebanon is really the host to this cancerous cell that's called Hezbollah. So Hezbollah also has responsibility to feed the people, to keep them safe. If Hezbollah pulls Lebanon into war with Israel and Lebanon gets demolished, the people of Lebanon literally will kick Hezbollah out and Iran would lose significant, uh, very important peace that's threatening Israel from the north, which unlike Hamas, Hezbollah are Shiites, much like Iran, and they're not disposable. Hamas for Iran is like a Dixie cup. They see them as disposable. They see them as a one-time, single-use organization. They can go to hell. They don't care. Iranians don't care about Hamas whatsoever. They're Sunnis. They're expendable to them. The Shiite massively built 20 years of investment of organization up north called Hezbollah. It's a whole different story. So I'm not sure the Iranians would want to waste uh, Hezbollah by using it now instead of waiting for the one time they'll actually want to launch a serious offensive against Israel or to keep them there for years as a deterrent so that Israel does not go on the offensive against Iran. Again, everything here is with a grain of salt. Anything can change in a moment because there's always tensions between uh, the Hezbollah and the IDF in the north. So one little mistake can turn into a war. Don't forget that. 
Now let's go a little bit broader here on the spectrum, right? Uh, Syria is not a country anymore. It's basically going through a civil war. We have the Russians there. We have Bashar there, Bashar al-Assad. We have the rebels. It's a mess. They don't really have a military anymore. There's so much going on inside Syria. They really don't have any desire, capability, intent, or ability to go and try and conquer the Golan Heights again. They're in a whole different mess of their own. So if Syria is not there, Egypt is definitely not there, Jordan is not there, Lebanon with Hezbollah, probably not there, but who knows? Who else? Well, let's talk about Iran. So Iran can't really launch a ground offensive against Israel. It's just too far, and it doesn't have a way to get combatants over there, logistically and physically. So it can launch a bunch of missiles to really hurt Israel. And they will, and they will. And they'll, they'll definitely cause a lot of damage, but it's not going to change the outcome of the war for Israel. But the retaliation from the Israeli side is going to be very painful. I can only imagine the United States will join and will inflict a lot of pain. Also on the supply chains, the Iranians do still make money by selling oil. And if the United States decides to you know, cut off that line like they did with the, with the Germans and the Russians, remember that gas line? I don't want to say the name, but the U.S. can inflict a lot of pain on Iran should they choose to intervene directly. So... Although they might, it doesn't seem like the you know cost effectiveness of this makes any sense for the Iranians to go directly. That's why they always use proxy organizations. But they might. But I would say probably 2080 that they won't. Uh, the Saudis is another player in the in the region, but the Saudis are best friends with Israel. They've been working together and collaborating for the past 15 years. They've been allies under the table for 15 years, and they want nothing more than uh, the Israelis to finish off Hamas. There's an older generation in Saudi who supports the, the Hamas and the Sunnis and the Palestinians, etc., etc., but the new and ruling generation of, of Saudi wants to do business with Israel, so they want Israel to win and win decisively. So they're not going to go against Israel, especially since Saudis are really intertwined with the United States on technology, manpower, and the development of oil. No, the Saudis are not getting involved. Uh, that leaves us with uh, Russia and China. So Russia is fighting a war in Ukraine, which is literally bleeding it dry right now. Again, it's their war to win, but it, they're not going to start a second war directly. And also, they also have assets in Syria, which are fighting a war. So Russia isn't really in a place to deploy more troops and power and uh, to go into another war. What about China? Well, China is in a whole different crisis of its own. They have a demographic crisis, uh, an economic crisis. And don't forget, China is a huge importer of oil. And guess what? The biggest exporter of oil is the Saudis. And the Saudis don't like it if Israel loses this. So the Saudis are not going to be happy with China attacking Israel, which is their secret ally under the disk. So again, anything can happen. Any of these countries can attack Israel and the World War III can definitely happen. But the chances of this, given the logic, is not very high. Although we're talking about the Middle East, so anything is possible. The one country that's a joker in this whole case is Turkey. Turkey have a massive army, hundreds of thousands of men, and they can ramp it up to a million pretty quick. Massive air force, navy, and they're close to Israel, and they hate Israel's guts, right? So what about Turkey? Can Turkey get involved? Well, I made a whole video breaking that point up because that's a video in itself. I'm going to put the video right here. Go watch that video right now. Tell me what you think. And if you haven't yet, right here is where you subscribe to this channel. If you haven't, it's my second channel. Don't forget. I'll see you in the next video.